it's not very pleasant to be confronted by one's own misdeeds and that to blown up totally out of proportion and kunjamari uh, pinna vechittunna it is a gentleman thank you thank you very much first of the department heading from janaki sharif omar shama and arati obeyed all the students for what has been a magnificent gesture of generosity i truly don't believe i deserve uh, this in the sense it was done paksha pandu parayna bolu kittumba kittate no it was it was really good it was really good not because of the avoidable encomiums which as a ritual came at the beginning which probably were also statements of relationships and connections which is something that one cannot entirely avoid but because this was a truly truly academic intellectual exercise that we had these two days i really don't think there is a greater tribute for a teacher or an academic than to be part or partially the cause for a seminar which is turned out to be without much doubt i can say one of the if not the best seminar that i have attended and in which i have not seen there are several things which make this seminar different unique one is of course the clear message that the english department is as much home to malayalam as it to english and that as teachers or students of english we are working with texts we are working with practices we are working with material which should not be seen in terms of language barriers but in terms of experiences and in terms of the way in which we can create knowledge and as the title of the seminar clearly said the foregrounding of the experience of kerala is definitely a way of situating ourselves and where we are and what we are doing and how we are doing that in an exemplary fashion and the fact that every presentation here every lecture here addressed kerala and addressed kerala in very different ways in very unique ways original ways i should say gives a lot of scope for hope one should say not the least of which is the fact that nearly 70% of the presenters were younger scholars every one of you sucheda Meera, Malavika, Arati, Saumya, who did I miss? Pippin, Arya. You make me proud. You make us all proud. I've been a teacher for thirty years or more, and there is nothing greater than to be taught by. once students and sitting here and listening to each of your presentations uh it kept on recurring in my mind um uh, how much more i have to learn and how much more not just in terms of material but in terms of approach in terms of methodologies in terms of politics in terms of the way in which 
even the way in which people spoke, the language. Yes, it was a chastening experience. Chastening experience which is great just at the point of retirement. Chastening experience also in the sense that no, the world doesn't end with me or with any of us. You know, the world continues. The university continues, academics continue. So thank you for everyone, Udayan, Meena, Kunyamad, Mathu, but more than you old guys, sorry, the younger people, thank you very much for having come here. It was an honor for me, it was an honor for the English department that you took the pain not only to come, but the amount of work, the amount of attention, the amount of, shall I say, commitment that each of you put into your papers and presentations. Thank you. Right in front. Coming to the academic side, I have serious doubts about challenges and accusations about non-parity in gender representation. If this seminar is any indication, there's too much of women's representation. Don't you think? Yes. yes. Hardly Uday and Vipin were there to represent the poor males, while the rest of it was taken over by women. And what kind of women? Women who were articulate, women were combative when needed, and women who had a sense of history working throughout. Now this brings us to the way in which cultural studies is shaped up in Kerala. And the fact that the presentations the past two days spanned across a number of concerns, a number of fields, a number of approaches. We had travel writings, especially in the virtual arena. We had the reading woman. No, I'm not making any special mention, but every one of them was different. There was no repetition. They were all working on original areas in their own original manner. And in that sense, I think the seminar is a great display, was a great display of the huge spectrum of concerns that right now define cultural studies in Kerala and in India. It is also, it was also an indication of the way in which Cultural studies has become not just broadly political, but very subtly, finely political, sensitive to very subtle issues, very small interstices. When, when I say small, it is not a diminutive, pejorative term, as, as one that I use that. There's a famous statement by Michelangelo who when he was visited by a friend and he was working on the face of a sculpture and three months later when the friend came again he was still continuing to work on the face and the friend asked what have you been doing he said I've been working on the face so what have you done in the past three months and Michelangelo said look at those you know crow's feet in the corner of the eyes Look at the fine lines. So the friend said, ha, huh, trifles. And he said, yes, they may be trifles, but trifles make perfection. Interstices are important. Little niches are important. And the micro is as important as the macro. And what I saw here the past two days was this very close attention to factors, to aspects, to experiences of culture, 
which probably to an outsider may appear to be very micro, but if I may borrow from Uday, which all served in one way or another to make the present unfamiliar, to make us see the present in different terms, in a different light altogether. In that way, the work here that was on display is of a particular caliber, of a particular standard, one should say, which belies the description of most of these presenters as research scholars. They are the panache, they are the complexity, they had the maturity of very mature scholars, or shall I say the maturity that some mature scholars do not have. At the same time, but I am so happy about that, and while this indicates that cultural studies can never be spoken in the singular and will continue to refuse any kind of homogenization and will refuse as a natural part of this resistance to homogenization to any gestures of power, at the same time, I also have my anxieties, my concerns. This afternoon I thought of speaking about the elephant in the room. Kunyamad beat me to it. But there is an elephant in the room. And it's not just in this room, it's not just in the rooms of cultural studies, it's in the rooms of most academic work today. An elephant is in the room as one which cannot be seen, or which people refuse to see, or even if they see, they decline to recognize that it is there. And when speaking of such an elephant in the room, will probably be the occasion to go back to what Anil spoke about and then Uday also referred to, to what one would call the origins of cultural studies outside academia in Kerala. There is an interesting parallel between the beginnings of cultural studies in Europe and in Kerala, and that is not a parallel in terms of influence. That's a parallel in terms of historical circumstances. If cultural studies in Europe originated or in its nascent form, in its pre-academic form, came up as a response to a particular political situation in which political practice was effectively made impossible. We had the de Gaulle years, 1968, the huge hope that there would be a radical transformation of governmental structures, the collaboration between students and workers and the possibility of an entirely different kind of political life was turned into its opposite with the return of de Gaulle into the French power system and the re-establishment of that structure with all its oppressiveness while at the same time, simultaneous to it, we also saw the gradual, some would say very sudden, but I would say the gradual decline of the Soviet system into everything that it was not supposed to be. In the presence of such a, an absolutist, statist system, one which went by the name of absolutism itself and the others in Western Europe by virtue of capitalism's absolute grip over social life. When political practice became 
extremely difficult, if not impossible. Cultural critique or cultural studies came up as a political practice in lieu of actual political practice. Culture came to be recognized as a proper arena of political practice, of political experience, of political life. And cultural criticism was not an idle work, as one would call literary criticism, but an imminent practice which effectively attempted or endeavored for a transformation through the medium of culture. We find something very similar here. And I say similar here not because that is taken as a model, but only because this happened a bit later. Immediately after the emergency, before which we saw the rise of political hopes in the formation of ultra-left-wing groups, and the post-emergency period when all such political hopes were dashed, and there, were, there was the reinstatement of a democracy which is only democratic in name. That was a context in which cultural critique came up as a practice that was in lieu of political practice or as a practice which despite being specifically connected with culture was primarily political in nature. I still remember the day when I was in Maharaja's College and walking by the Dabba Hall ground when Chinmayananda's Gita Jnana Yajna was going on to a packed audience of nearly 3,000 people in the Dabba Hall ground. So the road goes both sides. As I was walking from one side and turned to the other towards the Rama Verma Club side, I saw T.K. Ramajandran standing there, hands tied behind his back, on the other side of the road, looking at this and listening to it. A little naughtily I asked, so you're listening to Chinmayananda? I was a student like he was in the evening college, not directly a student. But he said, no, I'm not listening to Chinmayananda, I'm looking at history in the making. And then he asked me, what do you call this? I said, it's Ralmiya Prabhashana Bhadeha. Inna Ralmiya Prabhashana Ana Nalaya Dhirashtriya Mai Maru Adu Kana Ngariya Kata Tholam from the beginning of this conference, T.K. Ramayadran has been an invisible presence. Not least because he was the occasion, he was the reason for the first cultural studies conference to have taken place in this very venue. In a very combative atmosphere. Where the Vice-Chancellor and the Pro-Vice-Chancellor where Sajida was a student, where clear in their disapproval of such a venture, and where the pro vice chancellor made it a point to come for the inauguration and pointedly disassociated himself and the entire university from any kind of politics that had to do with the seminar. It was called visitations of the past, Hindu revivalism and popular culture. It is inevitable that T.K. Ramayandran will be referred again. T.V. Madhu will say, why do we have to inflict T.K. Ramayandran on the younger people? We have to, Madhu. If not T.K. Ramayandran, they have to have a sense of history. 
From that point onwards, the work of TK, as has already been indicated here, has been concerned, as with many other people, M. Murali Tharan, for instance, one of the best intellectuals that Kerala has known, a great, a great historian who passed away very in an untimely fashion. A man who could joke brilliantly, was a great tennis player at the same time, but then died of an enlarged heart, and about which TK said, I always knew you had a large heart. The work of all those people at that point of time were primarily concerned with a specter very unlike the one that haunted Europe. A specter that was burgeoning, that was in the formation from the 1980s onwards. At that seminar, K.M. Krishnan presented a paper on Kshetra Puniruddharana Samadhis and the way in which they create a Hindu political community. Sakriya, Paul Sakriya did not make a presentation, which he is basically incapable of, but he spoke. And he spoke about how Udayam Varaja Samskariga Nayagara Engariyana Valara Vargiya Maya Samudayaga Maya Asiyangalda Vahagarai Marunada Media for such ideas. Ken Panikya spoke about, Murli had passed away by then. And Kailin Panikya spoke in the valedictory address about the erasures within history. A great example of which we saw in Middle Paul's presentation yesterday, where Kailin Panikya himself should probably be critiqued. What I'm trying to indicate is that from 1996, this is nearly 25 years hence. And that specter is no longer a specter. That specter is real. Kunyamat spoke about genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are on the verge of a genocide. Whatever we are seeing around us in terms of interventions, infractions into what one should wear, what one should eat, what one should speak, where one should go, what spaces one can occupy, who can occupy what spaces, are all indications of an extremely strong proclivity towards genocide gathering force minute by minute around us. What do genocides do? Yes, it's time for us to ask such simple questions. What do genocides do? Genocides kill people. But genocides not only kill people in their homes, in their thousands, what we saw in Eastern Europe, what we saw in Africa, they don't only kill people, they kill cultures, entire cultures. As Benjamin said, the victors take away the spoils, leaving only destruction behind. We are in the midst of an immeasurable, a wave of immeasurable strength, where knowledges, cultures of intellectual work are under the direst possible threat that we have witnessed in centuries, I should say. The place that 
उदय कांस पर जेएनयू व्हाट इज हैपनिंग इन जेएनयू इज प्रिसाइसली अ काइंड ऑफ ड्रेस रिहर्सल फॉर व्हाट विल हैपन इन द रेस्ट ऑफ द कंट्री इट इज अ डिसमेंटलिंग ऑफ नॉट जस्ट अ यूनिवर्सिटी बट द कांसेप्ट ऑफ अ यूनिवर्सिटी ब्रिक बाय इंटेलेक्चुअल ब्रिक and the imposition of a majority and arbitrary understanding of what knowledge is but unfortunately not unfortunately predictably the fact is that the impact of the same can be seen in practically every field every sphere of our life there is a right wingization taking place it's not a very fortunate term there is a right wingization taking place in our discourses in the way we interact with each other if i may just give an example look at the violence that is perpetrated on social media every day not just against women are not just against dalits it's against anything that seems to be a process to one's own view this culture of intolerance i would call it culture of intolerance which is designed to create a culture of silence and a culture of fear has seeped into every interstice of our life the case of nizar ahmed one of the best philosophers we have in kerala a person who right right not as rights in malayalam a person who thinks in malayalam a person who is given to a life of thinking of contemplation the way in which he has been attacked trivialized by i'm sorry i don't have a better word when i have worse words by some upstarts who think writing three lines on facebook is punditry this is not isolated this is part of a much larger picture of anti intellectualism that is becoming the rule of the day and that is where the elephant in the room becomes very important and what do we have as a response and this is where i go back to what they said and what i concluded with when i you know conclude after this after this presentation when the idea of difference itself becomes the site for the erasure of differences when concepts such as secularism democracy constitutional values are taken for granted as predefined as something that we own by right due to some kind of notions of kerala exclusionism we have heard of american exclusionism we have a brand of kerala exclusionism because we take three baths a day and so we are different from the others this kind of kerala exclusionism marx has interestingly said you make meaning in a word not by looking at a dictionary but through practice secular is not a given word it has no given meanings neither does democracy it is what you make of it autonomy freedom is what you make of it how you practice it and if one thing so a few people think that a resistance to the culture of intolerance is possible by patting oneself on the back and saying that we are kerala 
and we have had Navotan from the 19th century on, and we are different from the rest of the country. Look at our social indices. We are definitely in for a very, very rude surprise. I'm not pontificating. <laughs> I'm just expressing my fear, sharing my fears with you. And what is academia doing in the midst of all this? You may ask me, can academia make any difference? I would say yes. It is because in its different forms, not just in the form that we recognize it as today, intellectual work has been sustained through the generations. And because intellectual work has always survived in one form or another, subterraneanly, that it is possible for us to speak about history. So at this context, this is a question that I would ask myself, and this is not a question that I'm asking of you. It's a question that I ask myself. What do I do? What can you do? Or what can we do? Mm. Catching hold of a memory in a moment of danger is a good way of expressing things. But when that memory fades, what are we left with? I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And that's what, that's juncture where we find ourselves. And what can cultural studies do? Not as cultural studies, but as political critique, as political resistance, where academic intellectual work becomes another form of resistance. What can we do is a question I want to end this with. I don't have any answers. There are answers that everyone should probably find for themselves. But it is an answer or it's a question which we shall fail to address only at the peril of the cost, not only of our lives, but everything that we cherish. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.